Amen. Now, Jeff, did I hear that right? That there was a, a time when there were more people in the praise band than there were people. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that is unbelievable. God has blessed this church so richly. Uh, I have the, the honor of introducing our homecoming speaker today. Uh, I actually know Ray. But he and I used to work together. Ray was my senior pastor when I was an associate at my very first appointment. And I was right out of seminary. And I had tons of energy and tons of passion and excitement. And I had the gifts. What I didn't have was any experience. <laughs> and I didn't know quite. There was a lot of things that I didn't know. And Ray was, for those three years that I've worked with him, was unbelievably gracious to me and patient and took the time to kind of show me how you, you'd be a pastor one day. He knew one day I'd be a lead pastor, and he was so uh, mindful of that. And it just I'm just so grateful. In fact, I was telling David uh, just a few months ago, I said, you know, I, know, I don't think I ever really appreciated what a gift it was to work with Ray. And I uh, wish I could go back and, and learn his, and, and continue to learn from him. He's just such a, a great pastor and great leader. Uh, Ray was also the first guy who told me that I should marry my wife. <laughs> I remember very well standing in his office. He was sitting down. And he said, you know what, Lindsay? You should marry her. And I said, Ray, man, I just met her last night. <laughs> Literally, I just met her. He said, you should marry her. But he knew me, and he had just met Lindsay as well. And he said, y'all two should get married. And uh, sure enough, yeah, he was a problem. Man. I, I did exactly that. I'm so glad that I took his advice. Um, let me just also say, being here, I, I heard so many stories about Harbor from Ray. He would use, talk about Harbor in his sermons and, and just all the great things that God had been doing in this church when he was here. Uh, when I got appointed here, I couldn't, I was like, man, I, I can't believe I'm going to be following Ray. And now that I'm here, I know this is one of the best kept secrets in all of the conference, Amen. this church. Amen. This is an unbelievable congregation. And it's that way because of you, because of the people. But it's also that way. Because Ray Warren was the pastor here several years ago, right in its formative years. And Ray was here guiding us, this church, to be as great as we are today. So, will you join me in welcoming our homecoming speaker, the Reverend Ray Warren? Thank you, Ray. Be here to associate any other week. All he has to do is call me, and I'll be here. Listen, uh, thank you for being for being here today. And uh, you could have gotten a lot better uh, sermon if you'd gone to a, I don't know, Bernard Grove Presbyterian or something. But bless your heart for being here today. And I'm, just, I'm really, really delighted that you've come. Um, and uh, just uh, so some of you, I, there are new faces there. I'm, I'm about 50 pages behind on the sermon here. But anyway, uh, just for those who don't know, uh, when I first came here years ago, uh, I was thin and had full head of hair. Um, <laughs> none of that's true. But anyway, um, it's uh, we spent the night last night with uh, our sister-in-law, Jackie. And uh, uh, Jackie married uh, my wife's brother, David, uh, 20 some odd years ago, about the same time Jill and I got married. Uh, David died this past year, and so she gave us her house to stay in and fed us this morning and all of that. And uh, just thank you for loving Jackie, one of the greatest people on the planet. She's right there between um, Evan, I mean Grant, and Jill. Grant, Evan, our oldest son, let me get there and say, Evan, our oldest son, for those few years ago, he's living in Providence, Rhode Island. He met a darling girl who he had to follow, and uh, I told him to take a lot of love, a lot of money for me to move to Providence, Rhode Island, but he is there. And uh, then Grant, our youngest son, his first year in college this year, he's there, and Jill, my lovely wife, uh, she manages uh, a neuro ophthalmologist office, and so that's what she does. You guys, three of them, Jackie, you stand up too. Aren't you glad that they are here with me and making me <laughs> so Let me just say, first of all, Curtis Campbell. Uh, Curtis. Curtis has always been a great pastor and a great music leader, and I could not believe that you got him here at Harvard Church. I was like, that just isn't fair. That just is not fair. And then I can tell you, when I heard that David Brownlee was going to come and spend a couple of years with you, he and Irene, you need to know that is a couple who've been a powerful, powerful presence in our, not only our conference, but our entire denomination being leaders in the United Methodist Church. And you, I mean, there's no way at all you could have any idea the caliber and the breadth of the kind of leadership that he and Irene bring to you. Amen. It's just incredible. So thank you very much. And then real quick, 
pleasure for me to work with Russ, and um, I learned much more from him than he learned from me. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And I told early church this morning, I said, you know, he preached every fourth Sunday or so, and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> because it meant the following Sunday, I'd have to follow him up. And he was just such a gifted preacher that it would just make you sick. I'm like, okay, how's this brand new seminary coming out being able to preach like that? I know his daddy, and, and, but I didn't know until he told me he's fifth generation preacher. I said, oh, okay, you, uh, God gave you some gifts and God gave you a bloodline. If you didn't preach right, we had something wrong with you. But what a gift he is, and Lindsay just makes him a hundred times better. You have no idea what a gift you have in them. Aren't they just the best? The time now is 11.42. My sermon is a little less than two hours. Is that okay? <laughs> and we'll be all right, I promise. And uh, uh, my church, uh, and uh, for those of you who are home folks, uh, they've been here for a long time, I should say, we now serve White Plains Unknown's Church in Cary. Interestingly enough, um, years ago, I was the associate pastor at White Plains United Methodist Church, and I was appointed to a church at Monkey Junction with no building, meeting in a school called Harbor United Methodist Church. Our first uh, choir robes we had were given to us by White Plains United Methodist Church. And now it's really weird, I come visit you uh, as lead pastor of White Plains United Methodist Church. The bishop felt, felt so bad for them, said I'll send you a reach around, I'll send you a ray, so I'm back. And they, and they have been tearing up my phone this morning, tell the folks, and I forgot to tell them, Tell the folks at Harbor, hello, and uh, we're praying for them. We know today's going to be a great day. So they have been buzzing my phone like crazy. So from White Plains Church, um, they send their love as well. Well, the scripture is going to come toward the end, all right? And um, But I'm going to use uh, a lot of the whole book of Nehemiah. So I'm not going to read all that for you, okay? Aren't you glad of that? And so would you go home and read it later? But there is a call that echoes across the eons, across the ages, that comes to you and I today. And it's so simple, it consists of just two simple words. It's presented as an invitation, yet it's, it's life's greatest opportunity on the face of the earth. It's also presented, however, not just an invitation, but as a command. Uh, this is life's most costly decision. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter what, the most costly decision is doing this command or accepting this invitation and this it, it has changed this this invitation this command has literally changed human history and individual lives more than any other invitation in all of history ever under its power wealthy people have given up everything they had voluntarily and depressed people who have been beaten down and they're they're filled with shame and and they feel they're not worthy, are suddenly filled with dignity and courage. People who are just drifting through life, who, who have nothing to live for, uh, find a, a cause they're willing to give their lives for. People trapped in addictions and sin and guilt and embarrassment and shame have been set free. And dying people racked with pain and, and with the knowledge of their pending death have been have become radiant with hope that can only come from this invitation. I've seen it happen in my own eyes. Many of you have as well. All because a couple thousand years ago, a single man with no connections, uh, no title, and, and no credentials other than an extraordinary life that he experienced with God. He saw two people in Scripture and he named Andrew and Peter, and he said to them, follow me. Just those two words, follow me. And this one command is everything. Follow me. It's the whole focus, follow me. Immediately, Scripture says, he sees James and John, and he issues the same call, follow me. Now, why would the writer of the gospel do two stories back to back, the identical stories, but with just different names, with for people. Well, in ancient times, they, they, in the literature, they didn't have a, a font of, uh, that you could 
creating italics for it, underlined and bold. And so what they would do in ancient literature, they would repeat the story. So you would understand this is vitally important. This command is everything. This invitation is transformational for your life. Follow me. This Jesus, he's a rich young ruler who everybody looked up to, thought he was the greatest. He had everything going for him. He was a Duke grad, you know. And so, uh, just had to get that in, Russ. That was just for Russ. Anyway, had everything wealthy, had everything going for him. And they see a corrupt, thieving tax collector. And Jesus sees these two men and he tells them the invitation, follow me. He seems to think that nobody is so good that they don't need him. And nobody is so bad that they can't receive him. In fact, the guy who everybody looked up to, the dude guy that had everything going for him, the rich young ruler, he said no. And the thieving tax collector said yes. Follow me. It is, a, it is so strange that this man who is celebrated for his humility, who was a servant of all, who watched people speak, should issue this most, most presumptuous command ever recorded. Follow me. And what he's saying is, hey, listen, I have mastered every sphere of life and death, and I want you now to obey, uh, to obey me fully. Embrace and believe everything I've said. No exceptions, no reservation, uh, no hesitation. Just follow me. You do what I tell you to do in every area of life. No other leader had said anything like that. Not Napoleon, uh, not Alexander the Great, uh, not Julius Caesar, not Oprah, not David <laughs> Brownlee or Curtis Campbell or Russ Nanny, not even President Obama or Donald Trump. None of them ever said that. How strange human beings across the continents and across centuries should decide that this one command, the greatest opportunity of their existence, that millions would gladly give their lives for it. And I wanted to tell you that, listen carefully, the main reason I am here, the main reason for this church is here, is this clarion clear call of follow me. So it can still be heard today in your world, in your neighborhood, in, in your sphere of influence. Follow me. Follow the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now I want to say to the best of my ability, which is extremely limited, the best know-how, I want you to hear carefully, for those of you who might be note-takers, a good note-taking time, to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus means I come to admire Him. I just think He's the greatest. I come to love Him and hold Him dear. It, it means to be wholly devoted to Him. All my thoughts, all my words, all my actions, all my time, every moment, all my money, all my possessions, the whole thing just surrendered to him and laid down before his feet. Everything you are. Now, turn to somebody and ask them, what does everything mean? Just ask them that question. Don't answer. What does everything mean? Now, I want you to turn to the answer and you say, everything. Now, go ahead and tell them, everything, all right? It's everything. It, it is everything. What it means is, what all this means is, I form an intention. I decide that I will do whatever Jesus says. I will strive to understand him. I will strive to study him. I will think about him intelligently. I, I will not be mechanical or self-righteous or legalistic about it, but I will actually form the intention. I will decide that I'm going to follow Jesus. In the time uh, of Nehemiah, the prophet, and that's the scripture, pretty much all the way through it, uh, at, at the time of Nehemiah, and a man named Ezra, a group of Israelites who are living in Jerusalem, and, and they're occupied, and they have rebuilt the wall of their holy temple, and so things are, are looking up for them as a people, but they're still ruled by other nations, and they're deeply, tro deeply troubled that they're not their own nation, that they're occupied. And they begin to ask, ask themselves, where's God? What is the purpose of our lives? Uh, we pick this up in Nehemiah chapter 8. And it says this, all the people gathered together as one in the square. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Now something really, really weird is happening in this text. Uh, it's unusual. There is a religious gathering. There's a group of people and they are gathered. They, they gather themselves in pain and in hope. And there's enough pain to die to their old dreams. But there's enough hope because the walls of their temple are being rebuilt.
God is doing something to live into a new dream with them. Now, this is just a freebie, another note-taking time. We must understand God lives at the intersection of pain and hope for you and me and for the people of Israel. God lives at the intersection of pain and hope. God can work with you and me there. There's this religious gathering. The lay people ask for it. No preacher, Pastor Ross or Pastor Dave, they didn't ask for it. The people asked for this gathering. And the text says, the people tell Ezra, the priest, to go get the book and read the book. We must know if our lives mean anything. Is there a God? Does God have something to say to us? Is there a purpose for, for our lives? What's going on around us? And if you look at Nehemiah chapter 8, continue. It said, Ezra read it aloud, the scriptures, the Torah. That's the books that they had. He read it from daybreak until noon as he faced the square. The presence, in the presence of men and women. And all of the people listened attentively, attentively to the Torah. Now, for six hours, these people stand there as Ezra reads the, their Torah, their Bible at the time. And they listen with rapt attention. By the way, just as a freebie, just off the side, how long uh, should a biblical sermon be? Do you know the answer to that? Somebody said 20 minutes. No, according to Scripture, <laughs> according to Scripture, it's six hours. Six hours. It's right there in the Bible. A sermon ought to be six hours long. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> I don't know what you're laughing at. I don't get it. But anyway, uh, but, uh, the obvious question is what in the world is going on here? How could they just stand there and listen to this man read from this text for six hours long? What's going on? Well, we all love stories. The human race, we love stories. And they're listening to stories. But these stories are highly, highly personal. And, but, you know, it's kind of like you imagine in our day, if we didn't have a text to read, if we didn't have a good book to read or a movie to go to or a television show, you know, so they're listening intently to hear what is God saying to them. Now, you know, just like in our day, how, we often hear, have you read a good book lately? Have you seen a good movie lately? So just to make things, well, really to wake up your neighbor, I see some of them snoozing. Will you just ask them, say, hey, read a good book lately or seen a good movie? Just ask them, you know, get a recommendation. Ask them right now. Y'all aren't doing it. We're going to be a long, long time if you don't find out. You know, because I believe in audience participation, for lack of a better term. I told the early crowd, Jill and I saw the intern a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. That is a great little flick. Anybody seen it? And anybody seen, now another one that's just for Christians, they ought to see this. I'm not sure the secular world would get it, but War Room. If you want to be put to shame, watch the War Room. I mean, that is a convicting kind of piece. But anyway, so we love it. And so they are listening to their story. What is God calling us to do? Who is this God? Imagine for a moment, never heard that. And living in this world, why am I here? Is there any meaning to my existence? Is there any hope? Or is it just that we're just this grumpy little people on a grumpy little planet where grumpy little people crawl for a, a grumpy little while and try to make money and have as much money as they possibly can and to avoid suffering at all costs and then we die. Is that it? They really want to know. And they listen for six hours to what matters most. This guy, Ezra, gets the book and he starts to read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And some people standing there said, God created heavens and the earth. I knew we were here for purpose. I knew it. God, it's not, we're here. And this is really personal. And this matters the most. And they wonder, what is God like? What is this God like? And they listen fascinated to the stories, the creation of human beings. They say, you mean we're not just these grumpy, random peons walking around earth. Human beings are actually created in the image of God who created all there is. And they look at each other and they said, that's you. You're created in the image of God. So if you didn't get a book to read or, 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 or a movie to see, just turn to your neighbor now and tell them, you're created in the image of God. Will you tell them that? Just tell them they're created in the image of God. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, God created that? Really? <laughs> this is really personal for them. It matters so much, and they listen with rapt attention, that we understand God created, and we're created in the image of God. And to hear the story about the fall and sin, how it comes in the world, and everything is wrecked, and that's why there's pain and disease and death, and things are so sad and bad often. And they hear about God, however, who doesn't give up. 
They keep going and hearing you hear about this guy named Noah and the flood and God's going to judge what's wrong. But the judgment doesn't get the last word because God puts a rainbow in the sky. He gives us hope even after we have a judgment, we're given hope. And God is always faithful. That's what the rainbow is about. God is always faithful and it's not over. Then the story takes another turn. The, uh, this God comes to a, a guy named Abram and he says, I'm going to call you Abraham because now I have a plan for you. You're going to create a new community and I'm going to bless you so everybody can be blessed on the planet by you. They look at each other and they say, that's supposed to be us. That's our call. That's our mission. That's why we're here. We are to bless others through who we are. Then they hear about another man named Moses. And Moses gave them a book by God. And it's filled with truth about how they're to live and how they're supposed to work. That children ought to honor their parents. That people ought to speak the truth in love. That people should, shouldn't commit violence against each other. And God has made creation that way. This really happened. They stand there and listen to the word of God for six hours with great intensity, with enormous gratitude, because it's about what matters most. And they realize they missed the boat. They missed the mark. And they begin to weep. They understand that this good God has a good plan for the life. And they've been living these grubby, stupid little lives, just wasting time and throwing their lives away generation after generation often living for what I can get for me, myself, and I. And their hearts just break and they begin to sob as a people. And they just can't stop. Oh God, oh God, how did I get here? How did I get where I am today? There had to be a better way and I have blown it. Aren't we thankful we're not like them? The leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, tell them, stop crying. This isn't bad news. This is good news. God hasn't given up on us yet. God has a day for you and me. God has a job for you. You get to be part of what God is doing in the world. So instead of weeping, we want you to go and party and rejoice. And he tells them, I want you to go out and rejoice because the gifts of God and the hope of God gives you joy. And he says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not in your situation, not in your job, not in your stuff, not in your degrees, for only God is able to make all things well. And that's what God is doing, giving you the joy that only God can give. So that's not a pious thing. It's really not even a religious thing. It's a godly promise. That's not just something you feel when you go to church. That is the knowledge that all, that all will be well because that is what God is up to. And it's not dependent upon your situation, your life, or who you are, or who you think you're not. God is up to something, and God wants to be up to something in your life today. Now, for seven days, they celebrate, and they're just in God's grip. And they come back together again, and they read the book for another three hours, and then they spend the next three hours that just worshiping God and confessing their sin and saying, yes, Lord. And then they make a decision. And it is 11.59 for those of you that have to be out at noon. All right? Just wanted to make sure. And if you're God's people, you know great sermons last six hours. So you're okay. Yes, 11.59. In, in view of all this, in view of all what God has done, in view of hearing the scripture, we're making a decision. They've learned. They've understood. They've wept. They've rejoiced. They've repented. They've confessed. They've worshipped. Now they're deciding. How serious is their decision? What's the intensity level of it? Just listen to Nehemiah's book. In view of all this, we're making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders and our priests are affixing their seals to it, and the people bind themselves with an oath to follow God. Now listen to this language. To follow God. To obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord of Lord. They decide to devote themselves to God. Now listen carefully. Listen very carefully. As one of the political candidates says, there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between a preference and a decision. 
Huge. A preference is a wish. It's a condition of emotions. Something I'd like to be the case, all things considered equal. I go to your house, we're having ice cream. Uh, I like vanilla. Okay, that's cool. But if I go to your house and, oh, we don't have any vanilla. You want some chocolate or strawberry? Sure, if you don't have vanilla, chocolate or strawberry would be fine. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a preference. However, decision is a binding choice. It's an act of your will. I make a vow. I set my course. I say no matter what comes, this is my path. There's a world of difference between having a preference and making a decision. And when it comes to issues that really matter, we don't just prefer. We decide. When I got married, I told the early church, just imagine and play war with the man that performed the ceremony for Jill and me. And imagine that he said, Ray, will you be faithful in your life as long as you both shall live? So help you God. And I said, well, you know, that'd be my preference. All things equal. Yeah, I guess so. Trust me, those who don't know why, that would have gotten nowhere very quickly. No, it's, it's a, I've made a decision. They're saying we will be devoted to God, and this is the most important commitment we are making. More important far than our money. Far more important than success, than even our health. More than anything else in the world. We will be a people devoted to God, and what that means is we will do what God asks us to do. It's not legalistic or self-righteous or pompous. It's, it's from the heart. It's serious. It's matter. It matters. And they say, God, we have not been wholly devoted to you in our relationships. That stops today. Lord, we have not been devoted to you with our finances. You, we've been violating the Sabbath. Uh, you gave us the tithe to make us a generous people, and we have blown it seriously. God, that stops today. We're going to do what you say. And there's a turning point now in the history of Israel. They are living in this intersection between hope and pain. And there begins to be this new understanding of what they will be devoted to God. And somehow, in some way, somehow, God is going to use that in some way they can't even begin to understand. To give the world unimaginable hope and courage and strength. Uh, no nation has been known for that. Then one day just Jesus comes. And here's what Jesus does. He takes all the teachings of the scripture, of the Torah, and all the stuff they were talking about that they listened to and explains it so anybody can get it. And he makes it accessible to people who are outside of the people of Israel as well as the people who are inside who are the Israelites. Jesus helps explain this, not about following rules. Uh, the goal God has for you and for them is not just that you do the right things. The Pharisees thought that was what it was about. But Jesus makes it clear that the goal is you become the kind of person who would naturally do the right thing. You become the kind of person who would naturally bless others, who would naturally not seek vengeance, who would naturally be a generous people. And Jesus offers his presence. He offers his forgiveness, his sacrificial love expressed ultimately on the cross. He offers his spirit, the power expressed ultimately through his resurrection. Then he says, then this is what Jesus says. Oh, guys, this will get you. Follow me. To follow Jesus means I admire him. I love him. I think Jesus is everything. But it also means I decide to do what Jesus said. I actually decide. I, I will put obedience to Jesus above every other priority in my life. And when this doesn't happen... When our priority isn't given to Jesus, it kind of puts Jesus on tilt. He says to a group of people one time in Luke 6, why do, you, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Look at Jesus' final instructions. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a ton of authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is sometimes called the Great Commission. I want you to notice that Jesus flushes this out. He does not say convert people so they'll indicate they are Christians who believe the right things and join the church somewhere. He doesn't say that. He says make disciples. That is followers who are taught to obey everything I commanded you. By the way, that's your job and my job. If we say we're followers of Jesus, that's why we're here. That's why this church was founded. 
To follow Jesus means I love him, I trust him, I admire him, and I've decided with the help of his spirit, I will always actually do everything he says. And that's the best life that can, is ever available to any human ever, is to follow him. I got a phone call at my office just a few weeks ago. And for those, most of you don't know, White Plains Church in Cary is on a main road that is surrounded by a neighborhood. And we don't have 14 huge acres like you, or almost 15 huge acres like we do here. We have four and a half acres, and we have, we're always stretched with parking. We have shuttle uh, buses that go to a, a shopping center that we have contract with so we can shuttle people in and out. And then they park in the streets of the neighborhood as well. And so I get this phone call, and this lady has left this message on my machine at the office of my voicemail. And she is just not a happy camper. I mean, don't tell. This isn't on video, right? I mean, somebody peed in her cornflakes. It was not a good day for her. <laughs> and so she's on the phone. I don't know her. I said, I got pastor. Well, I just want you to know. This morning, I can't even see out of my traffic because there are people from your church parked on either side of my traffic. And I can't see out. They continue to do that. Why do y'all do that? And then she went on and on and she said words that sailors shouldn't use. I mean, she was not happy. And she just railed into me and didn't know me from Adam's house cat. And I'm just, as I'm listening to her, I'm just getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And I want to say, well, you know, bless God, if you've been in church, you wouldn't have to worry about getting out of your thing. And you know, God, I'm just getting all self-righteous and angry. And so when it was over, I just hit the lead. And then the lead, and I remembered this guy that I'm talking about this morning said, oh, I hate it when you get so personal. Uh, Ray, love your neighbor. I said, all right, Jesus. If you want this woman to receive patience and love, I'll call Jill and have her give her a call. <laughs> I wasn't up to the task at that moment. I talked to a guy a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. He's working two jobs to support his family. And um, he, has, uh, he has children, his wife. His wife is working two jobs. And uh, his mother lives with him. And he's working two jobs. His, his wife and he are working two jobs to support his family. And then I remembered this guy, Jesus, got into my business again and he said oh, do not store up treasures on earth where moths and thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven and I think about oh Lord I'm so blessed I'm so blessed I think about how blessed true folks I, I wish you could hear and feel my heart and my soul the churches and the people that I have been so unbelievably blessed to serve alongside have radically transformed who I am, hopefully in a better image of Christ. And you folks here played an enormous part of that. But every moment is a chance to be Jesus. I was on Interstate 40. Have anyone ever driven along the Beltline in Raleigh? Anyone ever driven that in that house? And on the northeast side of the Beltline, they're, they're doing all kinds of construction. And I was headed over Wake Med from Cary the other day, and it was like a parking lot. It's 12 at night. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if the roast is burning, God has another one in the food line, okay? So, <clears throat> I'm on I-40, and I'm in the far left lane. There's three lanes of traffic. I'm in the far left lane, near the, the barrier between us and the other road, other highway going the opposite direction. And I see in my rearview mirror, there's a car coming up that far left, you know the place where you wreck and you park? You know, that lane where nobody goes? And coming up that lane on the far left side where nobody is supposed to be. And I see him coming up and I'm like, oh my gosh. And he gets up there and then I'm like, you knucklehead, you jerk. That means, you know, I'm thinking, who do you think you are? And, uh, and I look over and, you know, I didn't want to do this, but I caught his eye. And I caught his eye, there's a ramp that we're coming up to, an off ramp we're getting ready to come up to. And he does this. <laughs> he's wanting to get off at the next ramp because he's in a hurry. 
And then to make matters even more ungodly, he's, he's driving the most beautiful new Porsche you ever want to see in your life. And I'll be honest with you, I was headed over to the hospital to see someone who was in critical need, and he's in a hurry to get off of his exit ramp. I really wanted to give him a sign of the Lord or a sign of something dealing with hand motions, but I opted not to do that because there's a, a sticker on my car that says White Plains United Methodist Church. I mean, that would be a great witness. And I remembered scripture. Get thee behind me, Satan. Stay there. But I remembered I shouldn't do that, and so I just told him. I wasn't very gracious about it. There's a guy that I was talking to two or three weeks ago who got involved with Zoe Ministry. This church is involved with Zoe Ministry. And um, he was a CEO of a huge uh, healthcare organization and hospitals and all this in Texas. And he went with Zoe to help feed children and take care of AIDS orphans and, uh, for a 10 day trip over there um, about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And uh, he went, part of his travels there was to go to a partnering hospital called Mugua Hospital in Africa. And um, while he was there, he was just, they were struggling, the little was. They were going through all kinds of transitions. And, and uh, so he goes back to Texas. And his kids are grown, and it's he and his wife, empty nesters. And he told his wife, you know what? I can do more good there than here. And he quit his CEO job to go to Africa to help a hospital out. The CEO, not long after, he was just going to volunteer. And not long after he arrived, the CEO left the hospital. And it was in disarray. And he gave up his time and his money to help out in the hospital. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Some of you have made courageous choices yourself to follow the Lord. And I commend you for that. But I can't say for you, but follow me comes every day. Because I discover another area of me that is not following him. And I discover every day. I need to say, follow me all over again. My guess is some of you are the same boat. We do the best we can, but you're constantly messing up. Anybody here messed up? Anybody know they're going to mess up? Anybody knows the person next to you is messed up? <laughs> Isn't it great to be in the house of God with people who struggle with follow me like you and me, and that we're wounded and we're scarred and that God of all love says, you're my kids. Follow me. And I will take you. I will take you where I need you to be and how I need you to go. We bow your heads. God, thank you for these people. I am so totally undeserving for being here. Lord, and that is not looking for compliments. That's not trying to be humble. Lord, you know my heart better than I know myself. You know the junk in my life and the scar tissue. And, and you know the mess that is, pervades my heart. And you still say, Ray, follow me. Lord, give me courage to do that, to follow you. I want to read you this little scripture. Do you guys have it up, Tony, or just the... It's okay if you don't. I've got it on my phone. <clears throat> as soon as my phone comes up. Over in Matthew 16, these words, as soon as it comes up. And then Jesus said to his disciples, that's you and me, by the way, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. You can't get your own way. Take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? For what can anyone give in exchange for their soul?